Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Kahneman begins with an explanation for the origins and basis of his book. He explains that most of the thoughts people have do not become apparent until it is brought to their consciousness, meaning that we often do not recognize the process of the decisions we make. Accordingly, intuition can have a range of biases that result in us sometimes making inappropriate or inaccurate judgments, which is the foundation for thinking fast and slow. Much of the book was inspired by Kahneman's work with Amos Tversky, with whom he researched decisions and judgment. Accordingly, their work on intuitive thinking and heuristics became popular in a wide range of fields where decision-making is important, from medicine to politics. As a result of their work, Kahneman figured out both the wonderful and harsh truths about intuition. Relatedly, it is important to acknowledge and understand the difference between fast and slow thinking, System 1 and System 2 respectively. Kahneman later describes how these systems are like two characters in your head, and intuitive thinking is ultimately the secret author of many of the choices and judgments you make. Understanding the dynamics between these two characters can be crucial in how we make decisions. Part 1. Two Systems 1. The Characters of the Story Slow thinking is the kind of thinking people use when they attempt things such as multiplication problems, while fast thinking is used to intuit things such as the idea that 17 times 24 will not equal 54. These two ideas can be broken down into two systems or two characters that show the differences between slow and fast thinking. Two systems. System 1 is automatic and intuitive, while System 2 requires a concentrated effort. As a character, System 1 would be the hero, while System 2 establishes order and tempers System 1's impulsiveness. System 1 refers to actions that require immediate response or are rote, such as 1 plus 1 equals 2. Meanwhile, System 2 actions require focus, System 2 actions include counting the number of letters on a page or looking for a person with certain attributes. Plot Synopsis System 1 tends to be constantly engaged and is always giving input to System 2, which exerts little energy most of the time, but kicks into action when System 1 cannot intuit an answer. Further, System 2 monitors behavior to make sure people can remain polite, despite feelings of frustration, among other things. Conflict Sometimes people's systems are at odds. An example of this conflict is trying not to stare at someone who is dressed oddly. In this scenario, System 2 overrides System 1's impulse to stare because it is not polite to do so. System 2 ensures we maintain self-control. Illusion We've all seen an illusion where things that appear to be one thing are an entirely different thing altogether. Similarly, people also have cognitive illusions, which are illusions of thought. System 1 can improperly intuit information, and System 2 can be unaware of the error in System 1's thinking, leading to bias. We don't always have time for slow thinking, so people must find a good balance between the two types of thinking. Useful Fictions Kahneman emphasizes that while he often uses the two systems as characters, they are just that, fictitious characters, because it's easier for him to explain how these systems operate if the readers can see these systems as agents rather than descriptors. The systems become players in how judgments work, which makes it easier for readers to relate to and imagine these complex systems. 2. Attention and Effort Mental Effort Tasks that require mental effort are too overwhelming for System 1. Accordingly, these tasks are accomplished by System 2. The brain will prioritize the most important function, and all other actions are ranked accordingly through System 2. During emergencies, System 1 takes over because, otherwise, it would be too slow to wait until we are conscious of the threats to deal with them. 
Moreover, the brain seeks to operate using the least amount of effort, and as Kahneman says, laziness is built deep into our nature. However, this exertion is required so that we can maintain several ideas at once and follow the rules. Further, System 2 uses task sets and allows people to change tasks, which requires much attention. It is especially hard for us to draw upon our working memory, and it's easier to use long-term memory, which requires less effort. 3. The Lazy Controller To show how System 2 requires a certain amount of concentration, Kahneman points out that if a person is walking and is asked to figure out a complex multiplication problem, they will stop walking to focus on the problem at hand, because there's a natural pace at which System 2 works. People tend to exert the least amount of effort to maintain this pace, which describes the law of least effort. Accordingly, it often takes willpower to push ourselves to work harder. Though people can experience something called flow that doesn't require the use of willpower but can allow the same amount of exertion without the added burden of having to force ourselves to attention. The Busy and Depleted System 2 When System 2 is preoccupied, System 1 is more likely to swoop in and make impulsive decisions in other areas because self-control requires attentiveness and can be put on the back burner when a person focuses on other tasks. This state is called ego depletion. As they are worn down, physically or mentally tired, people have less ability to persevere through tasks, showing that if people overexert themselves, it can heavily impact their decision-making down the road. The Lazy System 2 System 2 is like a fail-safe for the judgments of System 1, determining what should be stopped and what decisions should continue. Yet, people often defer to System 1 to avoid putting in effort, and even intelligent people can fall into this trap. Despite the inclination to not engage System 2, people do have the choice to exert effort and fight the laziness of System 2. Intelligence, Control, and Rationality To explore self-control as it relates to how people think, Kahneman points out a famous experiment where children were given the choice between having one Oreo when they rang a bell or waiting 15 minutes and being given two Oreos. They found that as they grew up, those who waited were less likely to do drugs and they tended to have higher scores on intelligence tests. People with these cognitive abilities can better delay gratification and pivot between tasks better. However, Stanovich argues that intelligent people are not immune to biases because being intelligent is separate from being rational. 4. The Associative Machine Kahneman begins this chapter with two powerful words, banana vomit. These words create an automatic reaction of disgust, and we become put off by bananas, which is system one in action in a process called associative activation. Ideas that have been evoked trigger other ideas. In this process, we link things by color, size, etc. nearly instantaneously before we can consciously be aware of what we are doing. The Marvels of Priming Priming is a technique that allows people to temporarily evoke a related idea. For example, the word eat primes someone to then be able to think of the word soup more quickly. Like words, our actions can be primed as well, which is known as the idiomotor effect. Primes that guide us. Priming can make people feel like they've lost some of their autonomy, because even just the reminder to an old person that they are old can make that person walk slower. The same impacts are seen in other areas, such as money or politics. Telling people about their mortality can make them more open to authoritarianism, because the rigid structures and control feel safer when people are terrified of death. With all this in mind, people must come to terms with the power of priming and realize that we all are susceptible. This is often how System 1 forms its judgments and can help us survive.
Five, cognitive ease. System one determines how much effort system two needs to exert by measuring cognitive ease, determining where things fall between easy and strained. Easy means that there's nothing crucial going on, and you're probably in a better mood. While strained requires extra attention from system two that can lead to cognitive strain, which is affected by both the current level of effort and the presence of unmet demands. Illusions of remembering, just like we can recognize visual illusions, we can also experience the same thing with memory. We hear the name of a celebrity who we know is famous, though we aren't sure of why. And this familiarity creates an illusion. As we see the name of this celebrity more, that person becomes more familiar to us, even if we have no more information than we did before about who that person is. Illusions of truth. Sometimes we can recollect having seen the answer to a question, but we can't clearly see what the answer was. And in this case, if something appears familiar, we often take that as truth through cognitive ease. Just one correct part of a statement that we recall seeing, studies show, can make a person think the entire thing is true. How to write a persuasive message. There are certain messages that people respond to. Which all create cognitive ease. Generally, simple messages are beneficial. Further, among other things, a line of rhymes can make readers view statements as truth more often. These things alone can't help if your message is obviously nonsensical. Strain and effort. Cognitive strain happens when System Two is activated, while also causing us to rely on System Two instead of our intuitions. One study showed that when a bad font was used, students got answers correctly more often because cognitive strain was induced and System Two kicked in, allowing people to steer away from intuition. The pleasure of cognitive ease. One experiment showed faces of different clarities, and accordingly, when the faces were clearer, people tended to smile more. This experiment shows that cognitive ease makes people happier, even if it doesn't lead them to correct conclusions. System one helps give people impressions of things they are familiar with, and when we are familiar with things, we learn that they are safe when nothing bad happens. System one, therefore, has much to do with our mood. Ease, mood, and intuition. The remote associates test shows that words like cottage, Swiss, and cake commonly make English speakers associate the word cheese. In studies, people can instinctively pick out linked sets of words versus non-linked sets. Further, accuracy was more than doubled when subjects were put in a good mood. When happier, people are more likely to rely on intuition, while the reverse is true when in a bad mood. When we feel bad, there is likely a threat, which is the kind of thing System Two handles. While when we feel good, we feel safe enough not to keep our guard up. Six norms, surprises, and causes. Accessing normality. While it can be very useful, System One does have many limitations. System one, first and foremost, is a web of associations in our minds that establishes what is normal, which in turn establishes our interpretation of things that happen to us and our beliefs of what will happen. People are surprised when what we expect doesn't happen, thanks to System one's assumptions. This is active expectation. Yet System One also ensures that certain events don't surprise us, even though we don't expect them, which is passive expectation. Something happening once makes it easier for us to fathom the second time. Thus, passive expectations can turn into active ones as we become less surprised by the events occurring repeatedly, and those events can become part of a normal pattern that makes sense in our brains. Seeing cause and intentions. System one gives system two explanations, and because we link certain things, system two often validates system one's intuition. 
certain images, like a missing wallet and a crowded New York street, make people associate the loss of the wallet with theft, even if there's nothing saying that's what happened to the wallet, which creates an illusion of causality. Not only do we make links between word associations, but we also tend to give things character traits and detach the physical from the mind. As a result, we intuit cause despite statistical information. Thus, people often use the causal thinking of System 1 in inappropriate circumstances. 7. A Machine for Jumping to Conclusions Neglect of Ambiguity and Suppression of Doubt When people face ambiguity, System 1 defines the context when there is no other, which favors experiences that are either recent or most memorable like the ABCs. System 1 does not doubt its interpretation, but doubt is intrinsic in System 2. A Bias to Believe and Confirm Psychologist Daniel Gilbert proposes that a person must first try to believe something before they can determine whether they don't believe it. In Gilbert's research, he found that if System 2 was busy with other mental tasks, people were more likely to believe that false, nonsensical statements were true, because when left in charge, System 2 is gullible and biased to believe. Accordingly, it makes sense that tired people can be better convinced by ads or other persuasive messages. Confirmation bias also plays a role in this, because asking if someone is friendly evokes a different response than asking if they are unfriendly, which plays into the gullibility of System 1. Exaggerated Emotional Coherence – Halo Effect the halo effect refers to people's tendency to like everything about a person who they like but do not know everything about. This can also work in reverse. People frequently do this with politicians. Despite not knowing everything about people, System 1 fills in the blanks based on factors like first impressions rather than the full picture. Kahneman vouches for the principle of independent judgment, which suggests, to avoid bias, People should form ideas separately from other people and be as detached from one's own first impression as possible, because people tend to give too much attention to what comes to their attention first. What you see is all there is. Wysiati Wysiati is the acronym Kahneman used to represent that what you see is all there is, Wysiati leads us to taking the limited information we have and jumping to conclusions, assuming there is no other information beyond what we've seen rather than questioning and expanding our own methods of judgment. 8. How Judgments Happen While System 2 searches for answers in a systematic, ordered fashion, System 1 is constantly evaluating the different situations we are in, and does not target its attention in the way System 1 does. Through these assessments, we can intuit judgments. Basic Assessments For survival purposes, evolution causes System 1 to use a continued loop of assessment, though that's less necessary now than it once was. One expert, Todorov, studied the biological origins of these judgments and found that when looking at others, people determined how dominant and how trustworthy other people were. Further, in one study, Todorov showed pictures of politicians and got an initial judgment of competence based on their faces, and in 70% of the elections, the candidate that was intuitively chosen won the race. This research shows how powerful an impression can be. Sets and Prototypes System 1 can form impressions without the assistance of System 2, and this is done with great ease. At a glance, we cannot do things such as counting how many blocks make up a pole, but we do get a general idea because System 1 represents categories by a prototype or a typical set of exemplars. Intensity Matching to explain the concept of intensity matching, Kahneman astutely uses an example of a four-year-old named Julie who can read fluently. 
He describes that this, if we had to compare intensity, might be comparable to a man who is between 6 feet and 7 feet tall. 7 feet would be too much intensity, while 6 feet would be too little intensity for how impressive reading at 4 would be. Meanwhile, reading at 15 months would be comparable to a person who is over 7 feet. Intensity matching is often statistically unsound, yet it is perfectly acceptable to System 1. The Mental Shotgun System 1 is always calculating and is often automatic, but certain calculations, like how happy we are, are voluntary. In such scenarios, people can make more calculations than they need to, which causes what Kahneman calls mental shotgun. In a study using the word sets vote or note, vote, note, and vote, goat, participants were slower to figure out that the latter was a set of rhymes, despite only hearing the words. They tended to consider the spelling and overanalyze the word goat, which slowed their responses down. 9. Answering an easier question. Substituting questions. People have intuitive feelings about most matters, even if they do not initially know the answer to questions. Accordingly, when situations aren't as straightforward as 1 plus 1 plus 2, System 1 substitutes the difficult question for a more understandable one. This substitution is the heuristic question, which helps find adequate, though often imperfect, answers to difficult questions. This ability to substitute is the result of mental shotgun and allows System 2 to slack off. An example from the book says that the target question may be, how happy are you with your life these days? Which translates into the heuristic question, what is my mood right now? This simplified question is paired with an intensity match to reflect the original question, such as deeming your mood as the same one you had during your wedding. The 3D Heuristic When we look at pictures, our brain substitutes the 2D rendering for a 3D heuristic. This can cause us to misinterpret factors such as the size of objects, because we assume that distant objects are larger even when they are the same size as closer objects. We substitute flat images and attempt to translate them into a 3D world. The Mood Heuristic for Happiness German students were asked two questions. How happy are you these days? And how many dates did you have last month? When the questions were asked in this order, there was no correlation between the answers. However, when the questions were asked in reverse, how many dates students went on and their happiness were correlated. In the second scenario, students were primed to focus on dating. So when the question of happiness was asked, a very complicated question, students substituted the happiness question and directed it back to the question of dating, using dating as a frame for whether they were happy or not. The Effect Heuristic the effect heuristic refers to how people allow what they like and don't like to dictate what they believe about the world. Questioning System 1 is a role of System 2, but slothful as it is, System 2 prefers to be an endorser rather than an enforcer. Thus, when someone looks for information and utilizes System 2, they will be more likely to seek information that supports the beliefs they already hold rather than trying to prove otherwise. Part 2. Heuristics and Biases 10. The Law of Small Numbers Looking at rates of kidney cancer in rural communities, which have been found to be both higher and lower than other more populated areas, Kahneman points out that while intuitively we can reason why the cancer rates would be lower or higher in rural communities, the two answers are contradictory and cannot occur at once. Accordingly, the issue with the rural areas is that they have a small sample size, which is less accurate. These impacts on samples are quite hard for people to fathom, even if intelligent. In psychology, if samples are too small, the end results can be very skewed, and many researchers simply use intuition to pick samples rather than using computation. 
a bias of confidence over doubt. It is harder to be skeptical than to believe in something, and doing so takes more effort from System 2, which is similar to the thought that a small sample size can represent the population it studies. This heightened belief is like the halo effect. System 1 jumps to conclusions with tiny pieces of information, saving System 2 all the effort. As a result, we are biased to be confident in the answers we intuit, rather than doubting them. Cause and Chance The illusion of pattern guides our interpretation of the world. Our brains are wired to find cause. Accordingly, it's instinctive for us to take a random series of events and link them despite the statistics. We don't like to believe in coincidence. Whenever possible, we look to make associations and create connections between things that happen, which can have evolutionary advantages, but also leads us to not seeing that some things are just random. 11. Anchors The anchoring effect occurs when people consider a particular value for an unknown quantity before estimating the quantity. When a number is planted in people's minds, their estimates tend to remain close to that number. For example, if someone was asked whether Gandhi died when he was over 114, then people will guess numbers much higher than if the number 35 was used as the anchor. Anchoring as Adjustment Amos favored using an adjusted anchor to estimate quantities. This means that you begin with the anchor number and determine whether it is too high or low. Then you move away from the anchor and continue until you feel apprehension, which is usually just short of the actual quantity that the anchor needs to be adjusted to. To clarify this, Kahneman uses the example of a teenager playing music too loudly who, trying to compromise, turns the music down but doesn't turn the music down enough for his parents' liking. This insufficient adjustment pursued by System 2 can create turmoil between the parents and the child, who feels as though the parents have not acknowledged their effort to play softer music. Interestingly, when people are mentally drained, they tend to adjust even less from the anchor. Anchoring as Priming Effect Kahneman favored anchoring as a result of priming, though he now knows there are two types of anchoring. He correlated priming with the System 1's desire to make information match pre-established associations. With this in mind, he saw a connection between anchoring and suggestion that would later be proven right, as were Amos's ideas on anchoring. The Anchoring Index Many psychological terms cannot be measured very well, but the anchoring effect is one that can be and it has been found in many studies to be a large part of daily life. Fascinatingly, random anchors have just as much of an impact as logical ones, so it is not impacted by whether the anchor has information or not. In one study, judges were told to roll dice before sentencing women who shoplifted. When they got the quantity 9, they tended to give 8-month sentences, while when they rolled 3, they tended to give 5-month sentences. Uses and Abuses of Anchors Anchoring can be used in marketing. In one instance, soup was marked 10% off, and when there was a limit of 12 cans per customer, customers bought an average of 7 cans, while when they could buy an unlimited number, customers bought half the number of cans. The number 12 anchored customers, causing them to buy more. Therefore, when negotiating, it is important to try to resist anchoring. Anchoring and the two systems System 2 can be impacted by anchoring and can be biased by it. Kahneman points out how unaware we are of anchoring. Accordingly, we should assume that whatever numbers we are given are anchored, and to use that knowledge to resist the impacts of anchoring. 12. The Science of Availability Kahneman and Amos determined the availability heuristic as the process of judging frequency by the ease with which instances come to mind. 
Because we substitute answers, it is unavoidable that we will have errors, thus it helps to be aware of the biases. For instance, if there is a news story that attracts one's attention, one will be able to easily bring other similar incidents to mind. As a result, things like politicians' sex scandals can seem to occur to us more often than they actually happen. The Psychology of Availability A study showed that while people who were asked to list 12 instances of being assertive were less likely to believe they were assertive, people who were only asked to list 6 instances rated themselves as being more assertive. This shows that the ease of thinking of examples matters. System 1 establishes expectations, and when they are not met, it is surprised. Thus, when there are fewer examples easily accessible and more examples required, people experience the bias of availability. 13. Availability, Emotion, and Risk Availability and Affect The perception people have of how risky things are makes a difference. For example, people think that death by tornadoes is more of a danger than death by asthma, even though death by asthma causes 20 times more fatalities. Factors like media coverage affect these perceptions because of how often we're made aware of certain things. Crucially, we create perceptions that organize a chaotic world, convincing ourselves that good things can't hurt us and bad things can never help us. However, as Kahneman says, in the real world, of course, we often face painful trade-offs between benefits and costs. The public and the experts. Humans, like it or not, are often guided by intuition, which relies on our biases and feelings. Even experts are biased, though they often make very different judgments regarding risks. There's debate on how risks should be handled in policy, because the balance between experts and the public is delicate. In general, people struggle to deal with small risks because we either blow them out of proportion or pay no mind to them. Whether or not accurate, what the public believes is true can cause havoc. Kahneman uses the example of terrorist attacks. Deaths from terror attacks are less common than deaths from other causes, yet terrorism speaks directly to System 1. This tendency to take a minor threat and catastrophize it through the media and public outcry is called an availability cascade. Moderately, Kahneman's opinion on what role public opinion should play on policy is that Psychology should inform the design of risk policies that combine the expert's knowledge with the public's emotions and intuitions. Tom W.'s Specialty Kahneman starts this chapter by describing base rates, or the proportion of marbles of a particular kind. He tells us about a student, Tom W., and asks us to determine the likelihood of which field Tom is studying, ranking them from 1 to 9. Because we have no other information, we will refer to the base rates and guess that he is more likely to be enrolled in humanities than computer science, reflecting the number of students enrolled in these fields. Then we are given a personality sketch of Tom. Accordingly, in the study, people favored fields like computer science because of the details given about his personality. People used stereotypes to match Tom up with specialties, even though they had fewer students enrolled. Predicting by Representativeness Later, Kahneman administered the same study to graduate psychology students who were aware of all the statistical information and terms. Even so, they still favored representativeness, the description stereotypes, regardless of their knowledge. The substitution used by the students was clear. Many people rely on these stereotypes, products of System 1, but predicting by representativeness is not ideal. Even baseball scouts tend to use the way players look instead of statistics, though, poignantly, a team that chose to use statistics instead succeeded despite doubt from other parties. The Sins of Representativeness Keeping in mind its imperfections, prediction through representativeness is still more productive than sheer chance. 
Many stereotypes hold some truth and lead to correct answers, but it also allows us to be more likely to make wrong conclusions. Kahneman uses an example of a woman on the subway reading a newspaper. People may be quick to assume she has a PhD over her not having a college degree, but at the same time, fewer people with a PhD ride the subway. With the description, concern for base rate disappears. Another sin of representativeness is insensitivity to the quality of evidence. Wiseyadi makes us resistant to ignoring descriptive evidence, even if we're informed that the information isn't sound. Because as we hear the description, we begin to make associations. System one tells us the information is solid, even though we'd be better off relying on base rates in this scenario. How to discipline intuition? To avoid letting intuition lead us to erroneous conclusions, we must avoid thinking that every thought we have is true. We're safer to rely on statistics and remember that intuitions are often overstated. We can use Bayesian reasoning to question the soundness of the information we have been given and to anchor our judgment. Fifteen. Linda. Less is more. Similar to the Tom W. scenario, Kahneman created a character named Linda in another study, where Linda could be a bank teller or she could be a feminist bank teller. Based on statistics, the more specific a scenario gets, the less likely it is to be true. Nevertheless, 85% to 90% of undergrads chose feminist bank teller based on the description of Linda. This became referred to as conjunction fallacy. Where two outcomes in conjunction were deemed more logical than just one, this experiment shows people's tendency to create coherent narratives, even if they are not probable ones. Ultimately, people don't always judge the most probable as the most plausible. Less is more, sometimes even in joint evaluation. In an experiment by C, subjects were tasked with pricing clearance dishware. C used two different kinds of evaluation: single and joint. The joint evaluation group was shown both sets of plates, while the single evaluation groups were only shown one set. Set A had forty pieces with seven of them broken, while set B had all twenty-four intact. In the joint groups, the participants valued set A higher because it had more intact plates. But in the single evaluation groups, set B was determined to have more value. This doesn't make sense economically, which is similar to how the Linda problem doesn't make sense based on probability. Though, while joint evaluation fixed the issue in Hsieh's experiment, it didn't fix the conjunction error in the Linda study. The Linda study and ones that followed show the lack of attention System Two pays, preferring to be inactive. Accordingly, it is the way of the world that people allow themselves to be swayed by how plausible things seem rather than how probable they are. Sixteen causes trump statistics. Causal stereotypes. There are two types of base rates: statistical base rates. Facts about a population to which a case belongs, and causal base rates, which change your view of how the individual came to be. Causal base rates are equivalent to thinking that because more green cabs get in car accidents, that green cab drivers are dangerous. Such stereotypes are natural for System One. However, they are not optimal for things such as hiring. Pushing against stereotyping further can establish more equality, but Kahneman says we should not deny the consequences of defying stereotypes. Causal situations. Ichek Adjen created an experiment where subjects had to judge whether various students passed a test based on descriptions. One group was told that 75% of students passed the test. While another was told 25% passed the test, which suggests the test was incredibly difficult. In this scenario, every student was deemed more likely to pass in the 75% scenario because of the causal base rate. Can psychology be taught? 
In one of Kahneman's favorite studies, Richard Nesbitt and Eugene Borgida, who wanted to see if they could change students' views on human nature, recited to students an experiment, the helping experiment, in which students were put in booths with a microphone and told they could speak one at a time. One student, told to feign a seizure, called for help. Of the 15 participants, only four reacted right away to the call for help, while six never got out of their booth, expecting that one of the other students would help. Accordingly, Nesbitt and Borgida showed a fake video of supposed students from the original experiment. They made the students look normal and had them discuss what they liked to do. After, students were asked to guess how quickly the people in the video responded to the call for help. One group was only given the details of the original experiment without the results, while the second group was given the results. The first group determined that both students would have helped the student with the seizure, while in the second group, the results were exactly the same, showing that even with the knowledge that only 27 of students responded right away to the call for help, the student's view on humanity hadn't changed. Finally, in another study, when the group was straight out told that the two people in the video didn't respond immediately, the student's guesses for the outcome of the original experiment was very close to the actual outcome. To summarize, subjects' unwillingness to deduce the particular from the general was matched only by their willingness to infer the general from the particular. 17. Regression to the Mean Regression to the mean refers to how people's performance fluctuates, and so someone may do something very well one day, but on others do the same task less well. Talent and luck People tend to correlate luck and talent, while we also tend to correlate weakness and misfortune. Imagine we're predicting a golfer's score for day two of a tournament. We're likely to use the results from day one to draw our conclusions. With the regression on the mean in mind, it is most prudent to estimate that a golfer who did well on the first day will still do well, but because we don't know how lucky he will be, we can say that he will not do as well as he did on the first day. He will be more on par with the average. A below-average golfer, meanwhile, will be closer in score to the higher-ranked player the second day than they were on the first. The bigger an outlier that the initial score is, the more it will change on the second day. Understanding Regression For many people, the idea of regression is hard to understand, but as an example, if you take scores for piano playing based on age and amount of practice, and also take measures for weight and ice cream consumption, there will be regression to the mean when we predict piano playing from weight, Correlation coefficients are another way of looking at regression. Accordingly, family income and the last four digits of people's phone numbers has a correlation coefficient of zero, meaning they are not related. Though Kahneman admits how hard this is to understand because of how wired our brains are to causal explanations and how off-putting straight-up statistics can be. Both System 1 and System 2 struggle with it. And even after learning about regression, it is a hazy concept. 18. Taming the intuitive predictions Some predictions are made using analysis and extensive data, while others are determined using intuitive judgment. Many decisions in professional areas are made using a combination of intuition and analysis. Non-regressive intuitions to explain the inclination to non-regressive intuitions, Kahneman begins by returning to Julie, the four-year-old who could read fluently. He asks what her GPA would be now that she's a college student. Most people would respond with a GPA of around 3.7 or 3.8. Reading early and academic achievement have a causal link, and our minds immediately use the information they have to create a connection. The information we have is compared to what's normal, and we compare Julie's achievements to her peers, determining what percentile she would be in. Then we would intensity match and substitute the original question by assuming that her percentile as a child and that as a college student would match. 
Finally, we intensity match yet again to convert the percentile into a GPA match. These are all functions that happen through system one. People disregard the progression of the mean, and by not embracing the uncertainty of their predictions, people had predictions that were completely non-regressive. A correction for intuitive predictions. A better way to predict Julie's GPA was introduced in the previous chapter using the below equation, as was done with the ice cream, weight, and piano playing. Reading age plus shared factors plus factors specific to reading age equals 100% GPA equals shared factors plus factors specific to GPA equals 100%. A wide range of factors would go into these different variables, such as family support. Pressure to succeed after early success could have led Julie to losing interest in academic pursuits, or a thousand other things could have impacted the outcome of Julie's GPA. To get this better estimate, we can start with a baseline GPA, our instinctive reaction, and then try to estimate the correlation between reading age and GPA. Then, say the correlation is 0 .30, we can adjust the GPA to 30% from the average. After all this is done, the answer will be more regressive, because without taking this step, intuitive predictions will be non-regressive. Of course, the answer still won't be perfect, but it will be more likely to reflect the true situation. A Defense of Extreme Predictions Intuitive judgments tend to be polarized from the mean. System 2's duty is to mediate these judgments and requires a good deal of effort. Though when you use this system to create unbiased judgment, the information has to be very good for the predictions to forecast extreme events. Accordingly, venture capitalists don't often choose a safe choice that comes with no risks, because they'd rather risk failing than missing out on something big. However, they still attempt to ensure that they have the best balance of risk and reward that they can. People must prepare for the unexpected, and by using corrective procedures, people can better know what they're getting into and act accordingly. A Two Systems View of Regression System 1 likes to predict extreme events using wispy information because of how our brains associate ideas and our proclivity to substitution. Additionally, System 1 is a bit cocky in its estimations, but System 2 also struggles with regression because the ideas behind regression are hard to understand, and most people prefer causal evidence. Part 3. Overconfidence 19. The Illusion of Understanding The narratives we hear about companies, people, and all other things we encounter makes us feel as though we know what happened when really there's just an illusion of understanding. Kahneman says, The fact that many of the important events that did occur involve choices further tempts you to exaggerate the role of skill and underestimate the part that luck played in the outcome. Moreover, the halo effect makes us often simplify stories to heroes and villains. We often say in hindsight we knew things that we only predicted because there was no way to truly know, adding to this illusion of understanding. The Social Costs of Hindsight When people are surprised, we alter our narrative to make sense of our world because we like order and predictability. When we watch a football game with two comparable teams, we look back on the game and remember the winning team as being better than they were, and the losing team as worse. Hindsight bias refers to our inability to reconstruct events accurately, and our tendency to erase the surprise we had when shocking events first happened. This bias can affect the decisions of anyone, like policymakers, as they judge future methods based on past outcomes. We forget that good decisions still carry the risk of going bad, and bad decisions still have a chance of turning out well. Recipes for Success System 1 seeks to make messy narratives more sensible, and it makes us feel safer. 
In an ideal world, a CEO with the strongest attributes would be most successful 100% of the time with one correlation. However, due to other factors, this is not the case. The terms we use to describe people also changes based on success. For example, a CEO who is floundering generally wouldn't be called methodical. But if the next year they are successful, that might be a term that is used for that same CEO. Again, this is the halo effect, and it's enticing to use causal relationships for why or why not people are succeeding. But while this might fit our need for a neat narrative, it does not reflect the full nuances of situations. 20. The Illusion of Validity The Illusion of Validity It's common for people to keep assuming their predictions are valid, even as it becomes clear that the predictions are barely beyond guesses and that they have no true control over what will happen. Interestingly, the inability to accurately predict won't necessarily hinder the confidence people have in their predictions, because it plays into System 1's view of the world. As Kahneman says, Confidence is a feeling which reflects the coherence of the information and the cognitive ease of processing it. The Illusion of Stock Picking Skill On Wall Street, a common illusion that is shared by stock traders is referred to as the illusion of skill. Millions of stocks are commonly exchanged in one day, but much of the stock market is a gamble. After all, in one study with a margin of 3 to 2, The sold shares of traders did better than those they bought. Further, two out of three mutual funds do worse than average in a year. In reality, people cannot have the skill to constantly win with stocks. Certain people can do better, but much of what these people do is taking a chance. What supports the illusions of skill and validity? With knowledge, we are able to see an illusion and recognize that what we see is not what is true. However, cognitive illusions can be trickier to crack. People in professions such as stock trading are highly trained and are exerting skills, which makes it feel as though they have expertise and control over the market. Often, they are unaware that really, they are acting on feelings rather than using skill. The Illusions of Pundits Pundits of all spheres like to believe that the past has answers for the future when much of the past was actually based on chance. They try to analyze what is to come. Unfortunately, research has shown that pundits, even focusing on their area of expertise, were not much better at predicting what was to come than regular people. And while more information allows better predictions, pundits often overblow their ability to determine what is to come. It's not the expert's fault the world is difficult. Ultimately, the lesson we can learn from all of this is that experts cannot know what will happen despite their training and analysis. They might sometimes get things right, but they will get many things wrong. There are many variables and complexities that make long-term predictions quite difficult. 21. Intuitions versus Formulas Peter Meal shocked the psychology world and beyond by showing that statistical predictions are stronger than clinical predictions. In one study, counselors were tasked with guessing what students' GPAs would be after 45-minute sessions. In the end, The formulas were more accurate than the counselors, and these results were reaffirmed in 60% of cases, and in the other cases, the results were a tie, suggesting it is ideal to use formulas for predictions. These results have been utilized in several fields and work in low-validity environments, which have many uncertainties. Additionally, the studies illustrated how people are not good at summarizing complicated judgments and are inconsistent because of various biases, including System 1's proclivity to letting stimulation adapt the judgments formed. As a result of these findings, it is best to leave judgments to algorithms, but this is difficult for many people. The Hostility to Algorithms Meal's findings were met with outrage. Many clinicians disputed these findings because of their illusion of skill. 
They wanted to believe that they could make long-term predictions. Meal's findings undermined many of the practices of clinical psychologists. And the problem is not that these professionals are not skilled. The issue lies in them not knowing where their skill ends. Plus, the idea of machines replacing humans is generally scary, which causes skepticism with technological advances. Nevertheless, Kahneman predicts that this hostility will lessen as people learn to appreciate the role of algorithms in their lives. Learning from Meal From Meal, Kahneman learned the importance of obtaining specific information. He learned to rely on factual questions, which could be used in a formula to try to avoid the halo effect. Additionally, he learned that intuitive judgment is not useless, and that intuition adds value, but only after a disciplined collection of information. Do it yourself. The skills described in the chapter can be used in our individual lives. The author helpfully details the steps we can take to choose a list of traits that will lead to success, and then collect information for each trait. Then we can tabulate the scores, close our eyes, and choose the candidate who is qualified for whatever role we are trying to fill, and not one who is based solely on the instincts of System 1. 22. Expert Intuition. When can we trust it? For several years, Kahneman worked with an intellectual adversary, Gary Klein, which led to them writing a paper together discussing intuition of experts. They didn't disagree in the paper, but they also didn't agree. Kahneman was more dubious about the intuitions of experts, while Klein was more believing. Marvels and Flaws Kahneman and Klein both agreed that a case depicted in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink was not a triumph of intuition, despite other opinions insisting it was. The book describes an incident where art experts looked at a statue and knew that it was fake, even though they couldn't be sure why. Later in the book, even Gladwell points out how intuition can fail by describing the election of President Harding, who was not qualified for the role but had a powerful physical presence. Intuition as Recognition Kahneman established the Recognition-Primed Decision, RPD, model, which he used to describe how expertise could be utilized in domains such as chess playing or firefighting. This process uses both systems and begins with the establishment of a plan that's created by System 1's associative memory. Then System 2 kicks in to evaluate the plan to see if it will function. While intuition is often seen as something magical, the mystery of knowing without knowing is not a distinctive feature of intuition. It is the norm of mental life. Acquiring Skills Certain intuitions, such as fear, can be learned after just one incident due to survival instincts. Kahneman compares this to Pavlov's dogs, who would become hopeful at the sound of the bell because they were conditioned to know that the bell meant food was coming. We learn feelings easily, but it's much more arduous to learn a skill, which takes years of practice and devotion to be able to process expert information with just an impression. Though with practice, these skills can become like second nature. The Environment of Skill Intuition can only be believed in limited scenarios when the environment being evaluated is predictable, and the person in the environment has time to study the conventions and patterns. Also, only in cases where the problems are straightforward can intuition be accurate. In many professional settings, the situations are too complex to accurately predict. While algorithms do better than humans, even algorithms struggle to account for all the variables of complex situations. Feedback and Practice A problem with experts is that they frequently overestimate their skills. Many do not know the limits of their own expertise. They receive feedback in their practices, which helps them develop their skills, but if they try to think too long-term, they've outpaced their abilities and intuited things that cannot accurately be intuited given their knowledge. Evaluating Validity 
Associative memory can help make an expert's intuition valid in a situation with great regularity, but it can also easily lead to false intuitions when the situation is more complex. System one kicks in using substitution to replace complex questions with quicker to answer ones. Twenty-three. The outside view, drawn to the inside view. While working on an Israeli education project that ended up taking eight years while having been planned for significantly less, Kahneman realized how predictions from the inside view, or a view that only looked at factors within the project itself, can be inaccurate while using the outside can be inaccurate while using the outside view can be beneficial. The planning fallacy. The planning fallacy refers to plans that are too close to best case situations and would benefit from utilizing statistics from similar scenarios to create a baseline. This view results from the failure to see an outside view. Mitigating the planning fallacy. As Kahneman says, using information from previous ventures to create predications is the outside view. Using this view begins with first identifying the type of project that's being planned, so that statistics from comparable projects can be found to create a baseline prediction. Finally, particular information from the project being planned should be used to adjust the baseline accordingly. Decisions and errors. Those who make risky decisions tend to become plagued by the planning fallacy and overestimate benefits and underestimate costs. Accordingly, people tend to be too optimistic about future outcomes. Failing a test. Eventually, on Kahneman's education project, the group refused to create a new plan, including the outside view, which made the project drag. Kahneman learned from the project, though, and tries to look at the outside view now. But as he says, it will never be the natural thing to do. Twenty-four. The engine of capitalism. Optimists. Some people have more of an optimistic bias than others, and these people are often happier people. They are innovative and bold. They are willing to take risks and are confident in themselves. When taking a chance, these people believe they are prudent when they are not, because they underestimate risks. However, they do use their spirits to raise morale and push through hardship, which can be advantageous. Entrepreneurial delusions. While the odds of small businesses lasting five years is around thirty-five percent, eighty-one percent of business owners believe that they will have at least a seventy percent chance at success. Unaware of the low odds, even when told that their projects would fail, those who continued anyway were more optimistic, which is the risky behavior that contributes to the economic dynamism of a capitalistic society. Competitive neglect. Optimism among entrepreneurs is associated with System One's Wisiati. Wisiati. People often fail to take into consideration competition and substitute related questions with ones like, "Is this a good product, and do I have a good way to sell it?" Rather than considering whether they can feasibly compete with others in the market. Overconfidence. One study showed the inclination towards overconfidence and illustrated how CFOs often were superfluously confident about their skills to predict the market. Those who were arrogant about their expertise could face huge costs as a result of their overconfidence. Optimism can help people remain invested in projects, and it is also needed for success. But overconfidence is not so helpful. The premortem, a partial remedy. Unfortunately, Kahneman is unconvinced that overconfidence can be altered fully with training. Perhaps training can be done better in an organization, which Klein details in a process he calls pre-mortem, where informed individuals can each give a short statement on the issue at hand. This, in turn, can overcome the groupthink that affects many teams once a decision is made.
and it unleashes the imagination of knowledgeable individuals in a much-needed direction. Part 4. Choices 25. Bernoulli's Errors Bruni Frey's 1970s work claims that in economics, people are rational, selfish, and that their tastes remain stagnant, which is contrary to beliefs commonly held by psychologists. This discrepancy in perception has been called econs and humans. Whereas econs are rational, humans do not have enough information to be rational, and they cannot detach themselves from their feelings. After seeing Frey's work, Kahneman and Amos began a study that reaped prospect theory, which modified expected utility theory just enough to explain our collection of observations. They wanted to figure out how people made decisions without the assumption that people would be rational. Bernoulli discovered that people do not like risk, and that decisions aren't always based on monetary values, but tend to be based on utilities determined by psychological values. This work has a glaring error, however, because Bernoulli's model assumes that the wealth utility will lead people to being happy when that is not the case, and people with different wealth can be just as happy. Additionally, Bernoulli failed to establish the idea of reference points in his work, meaning that while one person may look at a gamble as a chance to gain, another might perceive it as a chance to lose, regardless of the monetary value. 26. Prospect Theory With research, Bernoulli's theory seemed increasingly outrageous to Kahneman. Utility theory gain is determined by evaluating different states of wealth. The gain of $500 versus the loss of that are, under this theory, given no different weight. In his work, however, Kahneman eventually focused his efforts on situations with a high probability of loss versus ones with a low probability of loss. He found that while when the situations were both positive, people chose the risk-averse option, when all options were negative, people were more likely to take a risk. Further, subjects were given two similar choice sets, though they had different starting points of money, which resulted in contrasting decisions. If Bernoulli's theory that wealth equals happiness was correct, people would have chosen the same choices in both problems, which shows how crucial a reference point is, which is the missing variable in Bernoulli's work. Accordingly, prospect theory incorporates this reference point. The theory also has two other attributes. Diminishing sensitivity, which is the idea that turning on a weak light has a large effect in a dark room, but in an already bright room the same amount of light might not be noticeable, and loss aversion. Loss aversion. When we make choices, we have to determine what the psychological costs will be if we win versus if we lose. Even if we can gain more than we can lose, System 2 determines that we should be risk-averse because the System 1-oriented fear we have of losing $100 would be more significant than gaining $150. Many people need double possible risk to take a chance. Blind Spots of Prospect Theory Kahneman admits that prospect theory is not perfect. He describes a case where the reference point is zero in all three options, and there is no outcome for loss, but one scenario gives a 90% chance of winning $1 million and a 10% chance of winning nothing. Prospect theory does not work for large sums, because in the example given, the chance at winning nothing would be incredibly disappointing. Further, prospect theory doesn't account for the regret someone might feel for choosing the higher risk, higher reward option, when they could have assured that they'd at least get something. While flawed, prospect theory adds to utility theory and makes it a better model for prediction. 27. The Endowment Effect Prospect theory suggests that people like to maintain a status quo to avoid a loss, though it is flawed to only consider someone's current state because people are impacted by past states as well. The Endowment Effect 
Richard Thaler coined the term endowment effect, which is the tendency people have to be hesitant to sell goods, even at much higher prices, such as Super Bowl tickets. In his work, Kahneman found that when people used their own currency to buy objects, they sold them at double the original costs, showing the emotional connection and sense of loss people may feel when selling goods they already have, which is driven by System One. Thinking like a trader, experienced traders are more likely to trade their goods because these people are able to reflect upon how much they really want a certain object and can avoid the endowment effect better. Poverty is another factor in this effect. Those who are poor are systematically forced to act like experienced traders. Additionally, cultural differences can also impact people's attitudes towards selling possessions. Twenty-eight bad events, negative dominance. Evolutionary aspects of System One make it easier for people to recognize negative or threatening occurrences than positive. A fascinating study showed that one cherry among cockroaches had no effect on people's feelings about the cockroaches, but a cockroach in a bowl of cherries made the cherries unappetizing. People learn early to use the line between good and bad as our reference point, which can change based on our circumstances. Goals are reference points. Golf is a good example of how reference point functions because players can either score above, on, or below par. Par is the baseline for good for each hole in golf. A birdie refers to being under par, while a bogey refers to being over par. In a study where golfers went for par rather than a birdie, regardless of the difficulty of the putt, their putts were more successful because putting for par is an attempt to avoid loss, while birdie is an attempt at gain. The reference point in this situation makes a profound difference in players' actions. Defending the status quo. In negotiations, defenders do well because they can establish and benefit from the status quo. People's aversion to loss makes them more likely to maintain the status quo because this is a gravitational force that holds our life together near the reference point that maintains the stability of our lives. Loss aversion in the law. In a study in Canada, Kahneman found that a society's morals have an impact on their reference point, disputing the economic belief that concerns for fairness are generally irrelevant. When companies use unfair practices and people are aware of it, they lose sales. People both fear loss and feel entitled to fairness in their financial transactions and beyond. Kahneman concludes the chapter by saying. If people who lose suffer more than people who merely fail to gain, they may also deserve more protection from the law. Twenty-nine. The fourfold pattern. Changing chances. To form a complex judgment, System One prioritizes select characteristics and gives them varying weights in our decision making. People, based on the expectation principle, should add more weight to outcomes that are more likely to happen. However, this is not what happens in practice. Rather, people add more weight to small risk outcomes and less weight to outcomes that are almost certain. Allais's paradox. In the fifties, Maurice Allais went to show that people would be impacted by the certainty effect and would go against rationality and expected utility theory. His results supported the certainty effect because people reacted differently when given a two percent difference between sixty-one percent and sixty-three percent, and ninety-eight percent and one hundred percent. These results showed that people were more likely to take a chance on the first set. While not taking the same chance on the second set, despite the ninety-eight percent being much closer to certainty than sixty-three percent, decision weights. There are a few striking patterns with how people make decisions and the way different factors are weighted. One example of this, of course, is certainty effect. Another is the inclination to overweight uncommon occurrences. Third is worry. The things we fear, we often prioritize. 
For instance, parents are willing to pay a premium cost for insect repellent that reduces the risk of harm to children from 15 in 10,000 to 5 in 10,000, which is compatible with the psychology of worry, but not with the rational model. The Fourfold Pattern Prospect theory reaped two conclusions, that people responded to wins and losses rather than money, and that people assigned different weights that are separate from what's most probable. Put together, Kahneman calls these ideas collectively the fourfold pattern, which can be explained using a chart with four quadrants guided by four qualifications, gains, losses, high probability, and low probability. High probability, certainly effect with gains, tended to make people risk-averse, while losses tended to make people risk-seeking. Meanwhile, low probability, possibility effect, with gains, made people risk-seeking and losses made people risk-averse. Unfortunately, the high probability loss quadrant is where many desperate people take risks, turning manageable failures into disasters because people crave complete relief. Gambling in the Shadow of the Law Chris Guthrie has come up with an application of the fourfold pattern to the law. A lawyer will tell a plaintiff there's a 95% chance of success, but if he accepts a settlement, he can get around 90% of the claim. This situation makes the plaintiff both want the certainty and the ability to avoid potential disappointment. Accordingly, the plaintiff is likely to avoid risk by taking the deal. For the defendant, the push is opposite because the defendant is drawn to the small percent of victory, but he also wants to fight back against the nearly certain loss. Accordingly, while the plaintiff is risk-averse, the defendant is risk-seeking and will want to continue the case despite the high chance of loss. In both situations, the outcome is weakened by intuitive instincts, highlighting the real-life applications and risks of intuitive decision-making. 30. Rare Events Rare events, like terrorist attacks, cause people to fear doing things such as riding buses in a place that has relatively high rates of suicide bombings of buses, despite the events being uncommon. Nevertheless, not riding the bus alleviates fear and is a response to System 1. Overestimation and Overweighting Three cognitive biases are related both to overestimation and overweighting, focused attention, confirmation bias, and cognitive ease. The association tactics of System 1 kick in as you try to form a coherent narrative of the world around you and construct something plausible. Accordingly, people tend to overestimate the likelihood of rare events and overweigh the possibility of such events in their decision-making process. Vivid Outcomes Utility theory proposes equalizing decision weights and probability, while prospect theory claims that probability doesn't have as great of an impact on decision weights. Rare events tend to stick out in our minds, and an event established in our brain is attached to a vivid image of the outcome, regardless of the statistical probability of that outcome happening. Vivid Probabilities one bias, denominator neglect, can be seen through the example of vaccines. Saying vaccines will disable 0.0001% of children sounds better than saying one child out of 100,000 because it does not create the image of an individual child being disabled. Rather, it creates the imagery of the 999,999 safe children. The format information is given creates vivid pictures in our minds and takes on a different meaning, which is a bias we must look out for. Decisions from Global Impressions Salience, or how much attention an issue receives, increases with each utterance of an event, and salient issues are often vivid, though salience does not necessarily match probabilities. Accordingly, salient events can be overweighed and overestimated, though there is a difference between choices of experience and choices from description. 
Choices of experience reflect scenarios such as going to a good restaurant and getting a bad meal on one occasion, which is distinct from events we have not experienced but have merely heard a description of. When we have experienced a rare event, we tend to neglect the probability of those events to occur. And when we receive vivid descriptions of events, we tend to overestimate these probabilities. Ultimately, when it comes to rare probabilities, our mind is not designed to get things quite right. For the residents of this planet that may be exposed to events no one has yet experienced, this is not good news. 31. Risk Policies Broad or Narrow Kahneman calls the logical consistency of people a hopeless mirage. People would often rather pay an extra cost for security than to take a risk. Subsequently, there are two ways to frame these decisions. First, narrow framing refers to if two decisions are contemplated distinctly, while broad framing refers to making one decision with multiple choices. Broad framing is more rational but humans often tend to use narrow framing. Samuelson's Problem Samuelson's Problem refers to a scenario where the economist, Samuelson, asked his friend if he'd be willing to bet on a coin flip. If the friend won, he would receive $100, but if he lost, he would have to pay $50. The friend was too risk-averse to take the bet, but agreed to it on the stipulation that he could repeat it 100 times. This request struck Samuelson as odd, because rationally it doesn't make sense because the coin tosses would cancel each other out. Accordingly, too risk-averse to take the single flip, but to accept the 100 flips. This problem leads Kahneman to discussing how people who use both narrow framing and loss aversion can have illogical results. Luckily, People can take risks while still protecting themselves from losses through broad framing, which is used by many people in the financial sector. Risk Policies Risk policy is a broad frame that embeds a particular risky choice in a set of similar choices. In conjunction with the outside view, risk policy can be used to fix the biases of both exaggerated optimism and planning fallacy. When risky choices are established in a set of risky choices, people can rely on statistics to minimize the risk on the whole. 32. Keeping Score Mental Accounts we create mental accounts to maintain control of our lives and exert self-control. These mental accounts are versions of narrow framing, which fuels a bias called disposition effect, the predisposition to sell winners rather than losers. Relatedly, people tend to fall for the sunken costs fallacy, wherein they're already invested in a project, and when that project goes over budget, they put more money into it rather than starting a new project that has better prospects. People do this to save face and avoid the embarrassment of failure. Regret Another bias we have is regret. The fear that we will later regret our decisions can be powerful. In studies, respondents overwhelmingly determined that a person who fails will have more regret. Additionally, straying from the norm causes regret, and moreover, success, not failure, is considered normal. Potentiality Loss aversion can be stronger in some areas of our lives, like health. Parents were given a chance to choose a less expensive and marginally more dangerous insect repellent for their children, and over two-thirds of them chose the more expensive product, willing to pay the extra cost for the extra certainty that their children would be safe. Many were disgusted by the mere notion of risking, even if it was only a tiny risk, their children's health for a cheaper product. Fearing and anticipating the worst is human. But if we are aware of the bias of regret, we can better make decisions that are rational. 33. Reversals In one study, a man was shot and injured in two different stores, one where he went regularly and another store that he rarely went to. 
When this scenario was used in a joint evaluation, people said the man should be paid equally in each scenario. However, when in a single evaluation, people said that when the man was shot in the store he didn't frequent, he deserved more money for his injury. This decision was determined due to the poignancy of him being in the wrong place at the wrong time, which made the event seem more extraordinary. Challenging Economics Discussions between psychologists and economists historically have been about the role of preference reversals in decisions. System 1 interprets single evaluation scenarios, while System 2 is needed for joint evaluation which can change the answers determined in the single evaluation. Economists tried to argue against the findings of psychologists' view of human decision-making. This dialogue between economists and psychologists about preference theory allowed better communication between the two disciplines. Categories while there can be discrepancies between single and joint evaluations, there is some consistency between these two evaluations because of categories. For example, apples and peaches are in the same category, fruit, and there would be no preference reversal because different fruits are compared to the same norm and implicitly compared to each other. These norms remain both in joint and single evaluation, However, if asked about an apple and a steak, the preference can change because they are not in the same category. With joint evaluations, some concerns become salient once they are put together, but not while they are distinct. Unjust Reversals One study used a fake jury and tasked them with determining how much money should be paid to different people. The results were different, as expected, when they were in a joint evaluation versus a single evaluation. In a joint evaluation, people chose to pay more money to a child who got burned versus a bank that had $10 million in losses. The bank's payout was still anchored by the amount they lost, while anger drove the decision to give the child more money. Meanwhile, in a single evaluation, the bank got more because they had more monetary damage done. This is the kind of judgment the justice system favors, which can be incoherent with psychology. 34. Frames and Reality Emotional Framing Losses are harder for people than costs. Accordingly, people tend to be more willing to pay $5 for a lottery ticket than to potentially lose $5, even when the rate of winning the prize of $95 is the same. The brain behaves in a certain way when faced with such decisions, and people struggle to keep their emotional associations separate from choices. Through research, Kahneman found that there is a relationship between the active areas of the brain and the ability to fight emotional framing. First, the amygdala, the emotional part of the brain, tended to be active when people were using either the frames of gaining or losing. Further, the part of the brain that deals with conflict is engaged when people fought their inclination to favor the instincts of System 1. Finally, subjects who could best resist emotional framing, the use of emotionally charged words, had more activity in the frontal part of the brain. These people were best able to balance their emotional and rational concerns when making decisions. People use frames so that they can lessen the burden on System 2, which is why our preferences are frame-bound rather than reality-bound. Empty Intuitions if outcomes are good, decision-makers favor certainty, but when there are two bad outcomes, they are more likely to take the risk over the more certain choice. Often we make these decisions based on moral norms, such as favoring actions that help the poor rather than the rich. Nevertheless, this attachment to frames can sometimes result in inconsistency in our decisions, we attach morals to frames, and as a result, these morals can become about descriptions, not substance. Good Frames Varying frames help us make different mental accounts. 
To see this in action, we can compare countries with low organ donation rates versus ones with high rates. In countries with high donation rates, people must check a box to opt out of a donation. But in countries with low rates, people must check a box to opt in. Both scenarios show the lethargy of System 2 because checking the box, unless one has already determined what action one will take, requires thinking that most people don't put in. Critically, the way organ donation is framed determines how many people will be organ donors. Part 5. Two Selves 35. Two Selves Experienced Utility There are two types of utility. The first utility, written about by John Bentham, is experienced utility, which refers to pain and pleasure. The second is decision utility, used by economists, which is about the rules of rationality. Between these two utilities, there can be differences that apply to different decision-making outcomes. When faced with pain, people would pay more to reduce their overall pain, and it can be argued that experienced utility should be argued in certain cases. Experience and Memory in relation to how people remember experiences of pain, two patterns emerged. The peak end rule showed that during painful procedures, when looking back to judge the overall pain level, patients' memory of the pain reflected how they felt during the peak of the pain at the end of the procedure. Secondly, a pattern of duration occurred, and the length of the procedures did not impact how painfully patients ranked their pain. Which self should count? Showing the decision-making power of the remembering self, Kahneman participated in an experiment where people's hands were submerged in cold water, and as this happened, they used their free hands to keep a record of their pain levels. They each went through a short episode and a long episode. During the last 30 seconds of the long episode, the water temperature was increased without the knowledge of the subjects, because of the peak end rule, many of the participants said they would prefer to repeat the second, longer test because of the slightly higher temperatures during the last 30 seconds that made them remember the lower pain levels of the final seconds. The amount of pain didn't change, but the memory of it did. Biology versus Rationality when decision utility does not correspond with experienced utility, the decision is flawed as seen in the test where people chose to keep their hands in the painful water for longer. It shows that our preferences are not always in our best interests or what is most rational. It also highlights the inconsistency that is built into the design of our minds. 36. Life as a Story like people remember the end of a painful experience, they also remember the end of people's lives and contemplate their own life as a story. Ed Diener wanted to determine whether duration neglect and the peak end rule would dictate how subjects described an entire life using two fiction lives, both with a character named Jen. He had subjects then describe whether Jen had a happy life upon hearing her story. Rather than adding a sum of all of Jen's happiness and unhappiness, people based their judgments on the state she was in when she died. When five slightly happy years were added to an otherwise jubilant life, subjects rated her life as being notably worse, showing that both duration neglect and the peak end rule help define people's life stories. Amnesic Vacations People judge our vacations based on the narratives and memories we plan to keep when the trip is done. In another experiment, Ed Diener had students keep a journal over spring break, detailing what they did. He had them give a rating when their break was over, and the students were told to determine whether they would want to repeat their encounters. The results suggested that the final score they gave their experiences impacted whether they would want to repeat them or not, despite the collective quality of their breaks. Accordingly, this speaks to how people experience themselves. Poignantly, Kahneman says, odd as it may seem, 
I am my remembering self, and the experiencing self, who does my living, is like a stranger to me. 37. Experienced Well-Being Experienced Well-Being With three other psychologists and an economist, Kahneman attempted to find a way to measure well-being which is difficult because people can't live their lives and log every experience they face. However, Kahneman and his team came up with something called the Day Reconstruction Method, DRM, which had the subjects answer an entire number of questions to replicate their experiences throughout the day. These results reaped some data, such as showing that American women felt unpleasant emotions 19% of the time which was called the U-Index. The U-Index could also show what activities the women felt unhappiest doing, and highlighted how the levels of happiness people feel changes throughout the day based on activity. Further, it revealed that to get pleasure, you must notice that you are doing it. Consequently, this study proved beneficial in showing how to measure experienced well-being, something which is more regularly used today. 38. Thinking about life Effective forecasting refers to a tendency exemplified by a couple on their wedding day. They are aware of the failure rates in marriage, but deny that their marriage will have the troubles that are so common. People struggle to reflect on their lives in an honest and helpful way. Thus, it is difficult to answer questions about happiness— and many people will just use a substitution or a predetermined answer. Accordingly, responses about well-being cannot be taken without a little skepticism. The Focusing Illusion The focusing illusion is simply that nothing in life is as important as you think it is when you are thinking about it. This bias favors exciting events, even though these events will likely become less exciting with exposure. Similarly, people's perceptions of what makes a good mood often doesn't match the things that actually make a good or bad mood. For example, paraplegics estimate they are in a bad mood only 41% of the time, while those who knew a paraplegic estimated they were in a bad mood 75% of the time. Paraplegics became accustomed to their situation while people who weren't paraplegic couldn't seem to factor this adjustment into their calculations. Time and time again. The way people remember themselves does not properly align with how time functions. They remember episodes of memories, and often the forecasts we make neglect time by only focusing on select moments, leaving out many incidents from our narratives, unable to appropriately analyze the function of time in our lives. Conclusions Two Selves Conflicts between the remembering self and the experiencing self have a complicated dynamic. The former is constructed by System 2, but the peak-end rule and duration neglect are products of System 1, and can contradict System 2's construction. Further, another important factor is time. Time is limited, but the remembering self is not adept at comprehending time, thus making it possible for clashes between two selves through faulty memory of experiences. An important step in sorting out the conflicts between the two selves is being able to measure people's pain and create indexes that reflect how content or not content people are. Econs and Humans Rationality in decision-making theory refers to the ability of people to be consistent with their reasoning. Various fallacies make it difficult to be consistent, because where econs are rational, humans are impacted by feelings and System 1 impressions. Additionally, humans must be wary of System 2's desire for cognitive ease, which results in laziness and people to prioritize intuitions over rational decision-making. Ultimately, humans, as opposed to econs, require guidance to make good decisions and balance the complex dynamic between the two systems that rule their choices. Two Systems 
The two most important characters of the book are System 1, which acts automatically, and System 2, which requires exertion. With the knowledge of how these systems work, people can better deal with the human shortcomings. System 1 operates based on impression and intuition, while System 2 requires deeper thought. However, System 2 is not always rational because, being lazy, it often defers to System 1 and lets instincts dictate its findings. Accordingly, both systems result in us having biases when making choices. Nevertheless, System 1 has helped us survive and is crucial when we don't have time to wait for our thoughts to become conscious before acting, and System 2 can be equally beneficial. Despite the biases, good outcomes can be reached when people expect their decision to be judged by how it was made, not how it turned out. If you found this audio valuable, please take a few minutes of your time to leave us a review.